a very warm welcome to this Chatham House online meeting. My name's Robert Brinkley. I'm the chairman of the steering committee of the Ukraine Forum at Chatham House. And our meeting today is entitled, Where is Ukraine in Biden's Agenda? Um, very topical, as you will know, um, President Zelensky had a meeting with President Biden in Washington just two weeks ago, at the beginning of September, a meeting which had been eagerly anticipated for months, if not years. Um, it's quite clear that the Ukrainian leadership needs the support of the United States as a key ally in countering an aggressive Russia and indeed in paving the way for Euro-Atlantic integration. And this meeting took place just as Ukraine was celebrating 30 years as an independent state, but also 20 years after the 9-11 attacks and 20 years as the episode of American and international intervention in Afghanistan was coming to an end. So as a result, the meeting of the presidents was postponed by a couple of days. And I think it was a very clear marker that President Biden has many things on his plate to think about, not only Ukraine. The United States does give considerable support to Ukraine, military assistance, economic assistance, political, but the decision by the Biden administration not to pursue sanctions over the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline really raised considerable concerns and worries in Ukraine about whether they really had the support of the Biden administration um, in the overall strategic priorities. When it came to it, would the Biden administration sacrifice Ukraine for somebody more important like Germany? And the Russian military buildup, which we've seen again repeated this year on Ukraine's borders in the east and the southeast, Russia's ongoing role in hostilities in Donbass, make the security situation for Ukraine seem as nervous and fragile as ever. And just at the moment, Russia, Belarus and others are taking part in very large uh, Zapad 21, West 21 military exercises. And what looks like a sort of ongoing stealthy Russian annexation of Belarus, I and mean, it's not being declared as such, but every week it seems that Belarus is more and more in Russia's orbit is adding to Ukraine's anxieties that they're also to its north in, in Belarus is not a country they can rely on. So this event this afternoon is going to talk about the results of the president's meeting in Washington. And I hope the speakers, and we've got a great panel of speakers this afternoon, are going to outline expectations which each country has of the other and discuss a viable strategy for cooperation between the two. Now, one of the problems with having a great lineup of speakers, uh, people who are really plugged in, uh, means that sometimes they can get unplugged at short notice. Uh, so David Arahamia, who is head of the president's faction in parliament, the servant of the people, uh, was called away at a, a late stage for an urgent meeting with President Zelensky. He's still hoping that he's going to join our meeting, but it won't be at the beginning. But we do have our other three speakers. We have Ambassador William Bill Taylor, former um, American ambassador in Kiev. Uh, we have Aliona Hetmanchuk, uh, director of New Europe Center in Kiev. And we have Ambassador Kurt Volker joining us from the United States. So welcome to all of you. Uh, welcome to everyone who's on this, this call. I see we're up to 70 people now. A um, couple of housekeeping points. This event is being held on the record and the recording will appear on the Chatham House website. 
the speakers will make opening remarks for up to 10 minutes each. And then when each of the speakers has had their say, we'll open it up for question and answer in our, in our usual way. Uh, and I hope as many of you as possible will have the opportunity to ask questions. We're going to take questions in two ways. You can either write a question in the chat function, uh, and then what I'll do is try and select a variety of uh, topics and, and different speakers. Well, I can't promise to get through all of them. Um, but you can also raise your hand in the participants function, your electronic hand, and I'll try and call on some of the people who, who do that and we'll get you live on screen. So I'd like to turn now to our speakers, uh, starting with uh, Ambassador Taylor. Um, Ambassador William Taylor is Vice President of Strategic Stability and Security at the United States Institute for Peace. He served both as Charge d'Affaires and Ambassador at the US Embassy to Ukraine and has diplomatic experience across the Middle East, including serving as the first director of the Iraq Reconstruction Office from 2004 to 2005 and as coordinator of international and US assistance to Afghanistan from 2002 to 2003. So I think very um, well able to uh, put Ukraine policy within the wider context for us. And I must say, um, Ambassador Bill Taylor was very widely admired for the authoritative and reasoned way in which he testified in the first of President Trump's impeachment hearings in Congress. Uh, very glad to have you here today, Bill. Over to you. Robert, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. Um, Arisha, um, Chatham House, thank you very much. Great opportunity for me. Uh, kind introduction, Robert, I appreciate it. It's great to be here with Kurt and Algona. Um, and we look forward to having uh, 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 David Braun or however he goes by these days. Um, on the question, this is a very interesting question, Robert, that, that you raised, that, that's the topic here. Where's Ukraine in the, in the Biden agenda? Um, and you're exactly right. We have some, we have some evidence. We have some, uh, some basis to answer this question. Not fully. There are things we know, uh, which we can talk about, and there are things we don't know yet. Um, and on the things we don't know, um, uh, the Biden team, which will help us answer that question, is not fully in place yet, as you mentioned, we talked about this before. Um, there's not a Senate confirmed ambassador in Ukraine. Hasn't been for two years, over two years. Christina Klein, the, the charge is doing a great job, um, but it does it, it does carry weight um, that there that that, uh, that a Senate confirmed ambassador uh, be in key. I'm I am confident <laughs> that this will happen soon. Um, I am confident that uh, there's a good person. Uh, identified um, and going through all the checks that you'll be you'll all be familiar with um, and that this will this will happen soon I'm, I am I'm very confident. but we but with that is a key part of the team that's not yet in place there's another key part of the team that's not in place and that is the assistant secretary of state uh, for Europe um, uh, people in this uh, uh, call in this in this room in this meeting uh, in this event, we'll remember Toria Newland. She uh, is now, of course, the, uh, the Undersecretary of State for Policy and playing a big role across the across the policy realm. She was in the previous in in the in the uh, Obama administration the Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and played a big role in Ukraine policy, a very big role, um, as everybody will recall um, uh, during the Maidan and then and then and subsequent events. So, uh, so we don't have that that person in place yet. We know who that is. Karen Donfried has been nominated and, and uh, is ready to go, um, uh, but the Senate in the United States hasn't yet confirmed her on the reason of apparently because of Nord Stream. So we'll come back to Nord Stream, but uh, the Senate is very concerned about the Biden administration's policy on Nord Stream and they're holding up these uh, nominations, including uh, the Assistant Secretary of State for, for Europe, which we'll have. Uh, so th there are these things that we don't know, um, um, but there are some things that we do. Um, and uh, let's just remind ourselves that, uh, um, that the 
president of the United States is a busy man. Uh, the, he sees leaders not frequently, um, and there's a small number of international leaders that he has met in his office, and President Zelensky is one of them. Um, there's a small number of leaders that uh, President Biden has called on the phone uh, once, and uh, President Zelensky is one of them, and it is more than once. There have been several phone calls from President Biden to President Zelensky, which we, which we can talk about. Um, uh, Robert, you mentioned the, the meeting um, of, of two weeks ago. It was scheduled, what, for an hour? It went two and a half hours. Um, um, it was a, a, a range of issues that were discussed. My own view um, is that the, the priorities that came out, that apparently were reflected in that meeting, and this helps answer your question, Robert, the priorities in that meeting started off with security um, um, and how to defend against the Russian aggression. Um, uh, security, including Nord Stream. Um, and I'm, that was a topic of, uh, of intense conversation in that, in that long meeting. Um, uh, NATO membership, you've, you've men mentioned that too, uh, Robert. Um, um, you know, that, that, was, that was discussed as well. And some positive, positive responses, um, certainly on, uh, on eventual NATO membership, as far as the United States is concerned. President Biden was careful to point out the obvious that uh, he doesn't decide this. This uh, Kurt Volker knows NATO better than anyone on this call. I'm, I'm, I think it's I'm confident to say, and he will describe how NATO makes the decision. And President Biden doesn't make that decision, but he but he indicated support, indicated that uh, that yeah he agrees that uh, that uh, Ukraine should be in, and there's work to be done, um, and it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, but there was that was a that was part of the conversation as well. Um, the other part of the conversation on security, which was, again, the primary, not the sole, but the primary focus of that conversation with, uh, with President Biden and President Zelensky, um, was the negotiations um, uh, on Donbass with the Russians. And again, Kurt Volker, Ambassador Volker, knows something about these negotiations. And as you mentioned before, Robert, uh, we had um, a person in the U.S. government. Earlier, it was Toria Newland, as I mentioned, and then um, it was Kurt. And we don't have that right now. And President Zelensky, I'm, I'm told, um, asked President Biden for that kind of focus uh, with one person uh, in the U.S. government. And we will see. This is one of the things we don't know, what the answer there is. And probably they don't know yet. Um, the administration doesn't know yet. But that's, uh, I'm, I'm going to come back to that. And I'm, I'm mindful of the time. All to say that the discussions uh, were wide ranging. Security was the primary. Uh, then they did get to reform, of course. Reform is important, um, um, and and that was certainly on the agenda. Uh, but the first thing on the agenda was security, uh, and in my view, um, that's that's the that's the right the right first call. There was additional funds, you know, there's 400 million dollars a year that's already coming to the security. There was another 60 million that was added. There was a strategic dialogue. There was a defense framework. Uh, there was a wide range of ways that the United States and Ukraine can interact and coordinate and and work together, reinforce each other, support each other. This gets to the point that um, that I think President Zelensky made in some of his public uh, discussions, public comments, um, and in various meetings that while while he was in the United States, both in Washington and and in California, that is. Ukraine's able to stand on its own. Ukraine has a, has a nation. We don't, we don't, there's no nation building that needs to happen in, in Ukraine. There's some work to be done, there's no doubt. But Ukraine is, um, uh, is building its own nation. Uh, it doesn't need uh, the international community to help it, help it build it. You know, that's, that's there. And um, it is defending itself against the Russians um, with, with some support, as I just mentioned, on training and equipment and weapons. Um, but it's on the front line. Um, and it is uh, de defending NATO, uh, defending Europe, it's defending the United States, defending the West. So that's an important component of that, of that discussion. Um, you mentioned, Robert, uh, Afghanistan, and you're exactly right to, uh, to point out um, that just the day before the Zelensky meeting, President Biden had Afghanistan on his mind very clearly. Uh, and um, it, is, uh, it is possible, um, that, that we might be seeing a Biden doctrine emerge. I don't know yet. I mean, it's not written down anywhere, but, but the President Biden's made a couple of statements that suggest that there is going to be a, a focus on allies, 
a focus on uh, on, uh, on negotiations. Um, uh, there's going to be a, a less focus uh, on military solutions. Um, there's going to be less focus on nation building, um, and that suggests to me um, that Ukraine building its own nation, defending itself, standing on its own, is a prime candidate for strong support under a new Biden doctrine. Um, we, can, we, can, we can talk about this. Um, the last thing I'll say, and, I'll, and I will wrap up with this, Robert, um, is that uh, as part of this Biden doctrine, if it comes, um, will be these negotiations that I mentioned earlier. Again, that Kurt led one, uh, he was in uh, part of the, part of the Trump administration um, and Tori Newland led when she was, uh, was the Assistant Secretary for Europe under the Obama administration. Those negotiations, um, it seems to me, are where the United States can make a real contribution to Ukraine's security. We can help on reform, um, uh, certainly, and the IMF can help on reform, um, and the international community more broadly can help on reform. But really, the re reform efforts are Ukrainian. They have to be Ukrainian. They can't, can't be done without Ukraine. Whereas on security, on these negotiations, on defending against the Russians, we have some leverage. The United States has some credibility. We have some capability, uh, diplomatic, military, um, economic, of course, but we have some ways to support Ukraine um, in that conflict. In that conflict, um, and I'm again I'll, in this that uh, uh, President Zelensky asked President Biden for some support on those negotiations. Um, we know that the Normandy format, the Normandy Four, has been trying uh, for seven years, eight years. Um, Minsk agreements are you know fine in goals, but not getting us anywhere. Maybe it's time, uh, President Zelensky suggests to President Biden, for a, for a new format or, or, or to shake up the existing format. Maybe it's time to do something different. And the addition of the Americans to that, uh, to that format or to those negotiations uh, to engage in the, in, in the Donbass question um, and eventually Crimea, let's not forget Crimea, but uh, first focusing on, uh, on Donbass, uh, maybe it's time to shake that up. And that would be a good component um, of a new Biden doctrine. So with that, Robert, let me turn it back to you. Ambassador Taylor, Bill, thank you very much. That was a great introduction, um, very comprehensive, and you did it within the allocated time. So thank you very much. Uh, I noted what you said, that perhaps Ukraine would be a prime candidate for US support under this possible Biden doctrine. I think it's a very interesting thought. Maybe we can pursue that later in the conversation. But let me turn now to our next speaker, who's Aliona Hetmanchuk. Um, Aliona, welcome back to Chatham House, uh, to, to our discussions. Aliona is director of the New Europe Center in Ukraine. She's also co-founder of the Institute of World Policy, where she served as director for eight years. And since 2016, she has been a member of the Ukraine-Poland Presidential Advisory Committee. Aliona has authored articles for numerous domestic and international media outlets, including the New York Times, Gazeta Vibocha, and the Moscow Times. Aliona, over to you. Uh, good afternoon. Um... It's already after, uh, actually, evening in, in Kyiv, in Ukraine, but um, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at today's roundtable. I am pleased and honored to participate among such distinguished panelists and the moderator, of course. <clears throat> well, I was asked before today's event if we can qualify President Zelensky's visit uh, to the United States as a new stage or even new start in US-Ukraine relations. In my view, it's maybe more appropriate to say about new chance than a new stage or a new start. New chance that the US gave for Ukraine as a strategic partner, new chance for Zelensky as a president of Ukraine with whom Biden never dealt before at least directly as a politician, a new chance for Ukraine-US relations. <clears throat> the big question now, uh, 
uh, if we, uh, and I mean both the United States and Ukraine, are ready to use this chance, this new chance. Zelensky visit was good, but he didn't reflect the reality because in my view, um, the visit looked much better than current state of relations between two countries. Better in terms of atmosphere and better in terms of substance. That's why uh, one of maybe important tasks today is to adjust our bilateral agenda uh, um, to ambitions and to agreements reached during the visit, including very detailed and very good, um, very ambitious joint statement and including strategic defense framework. Um, in my view, um, the visit actually was about getting our relations back on the right track. But uh, what we need now, we need to raise the level of our relations, not just get back them to normalcy. Uh, getting back to normalcy, of course, is good, especially after that rocky period um, which we had at the beginning of Biden presidency. But uh, it would be, but much better it would be to upgrade these relations, just not just to back them to normalcy. How is the visit and the relations um, are perceived in Kiev now? Uh, the best way to answer this question uh, uh, is to compare Ukraine's expectations, uh, what actually our moderator, Mr. Brinkley, mentioned in the beginning, with our achievements, Ukraine's achievement so far. Uh, the key expectation was to have White House visit as a such. And um, uh, the visit, as some of our panelists already mentioned, was postponed twice. And there were real concerns in Kiev that it could be postponed or even canceled at all due to Afghanistan crisis and some other domestic uh, challenges. Let's not forget that under Trump, Trump presidency, Zelensky was also invited to White House, but it never happened under previous administration. So it's good that Biden, uh, President Biden perceived his invitation to Zelensky as political commitment and he delivered and he invited him and set the date and didn't postpone it again. Uh, Moreover, just some six months ago, a potential phone call between two presidents was perceived in Kiev as a diplomatic achievement. And since then, since April, uh, we already had two phone calls between our presidents. Zelensky visit to White House as the second European leader who was hosted at Oval Office after Chancellor Merkel and eight, uh, eight foreign uh, leaders in general. And State Secretary Blinken paid a visit to Ukraine as one of his uh, first European bilateral visits. Also, the US Energy Minister participated at Crimea Platform Inaugural Summit. All those contacts show uh, actually how Ukraine has advanced in its dialogue with the US in just six months. Agree that not many countries in the world are enjoying such a level of contacts now. <clears throat> the second Ukraine's, and especially I would say Ukraine's authority expectation, and Ambassador Taylor uh, mentioned uh, about it a little bit, uh, was to have predominantly security talks, not uh, in extensive exchange on reforms with uh, clear anti-corruption focus. I can assume that for President Zelensky, it was really important to avoid public criticism directly from President Biden and directly from the White House on lack of reforms or insufficient fight with corruption. And actually it happened, Zelensky indeed got heavy security and defense talks at his White House meetings. We still don't know what was discussed uh, at tete a tete meeting. And um, hopefully reforms issue was addressed there accordingly, because otherwise it could create a wrong perception in Kiev, or even already created um, based on my talks with some government uh, officials 
that reforms and anti-corruption are no longer as important for Biden administration in Ukraine's case, case as they were before. Uh, Biden's administration uh, could have an enormous transformative force on Ukraine and, uh, and it would be good to apply it and to use it as this transformative force. So I really hope that uh, reforms meetings, uh, reforms issue was addressed at least at that, at that part of, of this visit. Ukraine also expected to get clear commitment from the US side about restoring US-Ukraine Strategic Partnership Commission. And uh, we received that commitment. Uh, Strategic uh, Partnership Commission uh, <clears throat> uh, actually is going to happen quite soon. Um, and um, the idea behind this commission is to build stable and strong dialogue between our governments without being dependent exclusively on presidential contacts. Even so, for the sake of justice, I have to admit that um, this format didn't work very well in the past. Um, strategic uh, Partnership Commission meetings always happened as one time event of under different foreign ministers. They didn't have continuation. Uh, that's why I'm, I, um, I'm less, let's say, optimistic about, uh, about um, restoring Strategic Partnership Commission, commission as, a, as a huge achievement, diplomatic achievement. So that was about the expectations related mostly to the visit and that, that they were fully met during uh, the visit. However, there are expectations that were met only partially, if met at all. And more uh, unlikely that those expectations will be met in next couple of years. Um, and that means that there will be a sense of dissatisfaction by bilateral dialogue in the future anyway, at least from Ukrainian side, at least in Kyiv. The major expectation uh, of Ukraine and its main challenge in relation with the US is how to transform itself from the US partner into the US ally to become real, not just ceremonial or rhetorical US ally. Ideally, of course, with real defense commitments, or as Ukrainians uh, like to put it, with certain even security guarantees. Uh, but it's important to underline that being the US ally for Ukraine is not only about the US defense commitments, but also about Ukraine's security commitments. And in the same days when Zelensky met Biden in the White House, Ukraine actually proved that it could be important contributor to international security, not only consumer of international security, by evacuating people from Kabul airport. Ukraine actually um, listed is listed as um, in top 10 of European countries uh, by, by a number of people evacuated from Kabul airport uh, during that chaotic uh, Afghanistan withdrawal. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the best way, of course, for us to become the US ally is, is to become NATO member states, because we are a European state and uh, that's the best and um, the more direct way, let's say in this way. But since NATO membership looks like a distant perspective, there could be also some bilateral arrangements. Yes, we signed defense strategic framework, and this is good. But there is no secret that Ukrainian and American sides have different vision or status of this document. While Ukrainian position this document as full-fledged bilateral agreement, American side doesn't consider it an agreement at all. But as a five-year document that replaced concept of partnership between Department of Defense um, and Ukraine's Ministry of Defense, which expi expires later this year. Also, this bilateral document cannot be a replacement for Ukraine's integration to NATO. It is an important complementary element and it could be an important complementary element to Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic process, but should not be taken as a replacement of this process. 
to be honest, uh, we are in Ukraine a little bit surprised by Biden administration reluctance to discuss Ukraine's path to NATO because we are not requ requesting immediate accession to alliance. We are not even requesting, maybe President Zelensky was asking at some point, but in general, we are not even requesting like immediate membership action plan. Uh, we are rather uh, asking for a sort of roadmap to membership because it is good to have a clear destination, which is according to Bucharest Summit Declaration of Membership, but it, it would be much better and much more important to have an itinerary or route to this des destination. Uh, we, we would like to know how we can get to that destination. And we need actually a tool which will prepare Ukraine to become a member of NATO basically overnight when appropriate political preconditions for accession appear. It could be membership, uh, membership action plan or it could be another tool. Because in case of Ukraine in Georgia, I'm not sure that membership action plan is the best, is the most adequate tool. Uh, during Zelensky visit, uh, Washington reiterated its support for Ukrainian membership based on the acceleration of uh, anti-corruption reforms and some other reforms. And um, my question is, if American partners think that NATO accession process is about reforms, uh, let's develop a list of reforms Ukraine sh could deliver, should deliver, in order to get to the next stage of its integration to NATO and discuss the next stage. But somehow everything is uh, talking about reforms and nobody wants to, to develop that list and to, to make it uh, as a commitment for Ukraine. Uh, also, we would like to see more U.S., um, uh, more leading role of U.S. Uh, among allies, uh, NATO allies in discussing issues which are crucial for Ukraine's security, not only future NATO membership, but also uh, related to um, Russia-related sanctions, Nord Stream 2 project. Up to that moment, regrettably, we have seen more willingness to adjust American position to the European especially to German, than to encourage European allies to correct somehow their position or adjust their position on above mentioned issues to traditional, let's say, American position. And... Um, uh, Aliona, yeah. thank you. I, I'm going to ask you to stop there for now. Yeah, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Yeah. More opportunities in, yeah. in answers to the question, but thank yeah. you. That's a great thank introduction. And I was struck when you said that in some ways the visit to Washington perhaps looked better than the reality of relations at the moment, and that you did hope that reforms in Ukraine were addressed during the meeting between the two presidents, but you didn't sound sure whether they had been or not. Well, let, let's see if anyone else can shed some light on that. I'm, I'm going to turn now to Ambassador Kurt Volker, um, who needs very little introduction in Ukraine circles. Uh, he's a distinguished fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, um, a leading expert in US foreign and national security policy with 30 years of experience, um, not least as US ambassador to NATO 2008-2009, US special representative for Ukraine from 2017 to 2019. And he's now Managing Director International and Co-Chair of the Advisory Board at BGR Group, which provides government and public relations and business advisory services to a range of clients. Ambassador Volker, over to you. Thank you very, very much, Robert. And uh, it's great to be with everyone and, and to hear these presentations, which I very much agree with uh, both Bill and uh, Aliona. I think you've made some excellent points. Um, I'm going to start, uh, if I can, Robert, trying to answer your question, uh, which is where does Ukraine fit in the Biden administration agenda? And uh, I would say the Biden administration agenda for the next year is principally about domestic issues. Uh, it is trying to get this $3.5 trillion infrastructure bill passed, trying to deal with surging COVID uh, outbreak again, uh, both the numbers of cases and the number of deaths are up, and there's a lot of difficulty in getting more people to take the vaccine. 
there is a concern that this will have shutdown implications, concern that this will have economic implications again. So uh, there's a lot of domestic focus. Also, uh, it's worth bearing in mind that the majority that the Democrats have in the Senate is held only by virtue of the fact that the vice president gets a tie-breaking vote. So it is razor thin in the Senate. And there is a presumption that the Democrats will no longer retain the House of Representatives after the midterm elections, which if that presumption is true, means that the Biden administration has one year in which to advance legislative priorities. So that is the priority of the Biden administration more than anything in foreign policy. To the extent there is a foreign policy priority, it's been articulated very clearly that it's China. Uh, that is the major strategic challenge for the United States looking ahead into the future, uh, and not just the United States, but the entire liberal world order. Uh, so that is where they want there to be focus. And then we have the circumstances surrounding Afghanistan, which have just burst over the walls, if you will. And instead of that not being, the Biden administration clearly did not want to spend a lot of time and effort focusing on Afghanistan. It now has to because of the debacle and the way that we pulled out. Uh, Secretary Blinken just spent the last two days testifying in the House, Far, uh, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, grueling testimony with a lot of criticism. Uh, from uh, members about uh, the exit from Afghanistan. And uh, it appears that it's going to be, to, to a point that Bill raised, very difficult to get nominees confirmed to foreign policy or national security positions uh, in the current circumstances. At some point, this ice has to break. But right now, uh, the ice is thickening against uh, getting these nominees confirmed, which is unfortunate because that would include uh, someone who has her hearing today, uh, Julie Smith, to be ambassador to NATO, Karen Donfried, who's already had her hearings but is now in limbo uh, because it's it's just waiting, and uh, someone who has not been, even been nominated yet, which will be a future U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Uh, so all of this is is uh, very troubling. Um, to the um, the Biden Zelensky meeting and what that looked like, and that was another question, Robert, that you just brought up. Uh, first off, I, my, my impression is that reform was discussed as well, so it was not only about security, but I think the administration got it right by talking about security first and recognizing that this is what Ukraine is most concerned about. They are being attacked by Russia, um, people are being killed, territory is being held, there are displaced persons, and the risk that this can escalate dramatically is very real. So talking about security first is the right thing. Going into the meeting, I think there had been a little bit of crosstalk between the Ukraine's, Ukrainian side and the American side, where Ukraine was interested in talking about security, but the US was pushing reform and saying that you need to reform first, and then you know, your security situation can be addressed through NATO uh, over time. That wasn't satisfactory to the Ukrainians. And I think that with the summit, the US side finally got it right and said, no, we understand it has to be about security. And in that context, you have to do the reforms still, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not waiting for those reforms for us to deal with that. So I think that was positive. Um, that being said, the way I would characterize the summit overall is a lot of the right words and a lot of the right strategic framework for the relationship but not a lot of action and not a lot of content. And that is now, I think, something that is up to both sides to fill in. Uh, there is a lot that can be done uh, within this framework set by the summit, but it needs to be fleshed out. Uh, as an example, um, the US has said the right things about opposing Nord Stream 2, but hasn't done anything. Uh, in fact, uh, waived sanctions uh, that could have been applied. And this project will now go forward to completion. So the next thing then is if this is happening and it's coming to closure, uh, what can we do to enhance Ukraine's security impacted by Nord Stream 2, particularly energy security? Uh, here, the, uh, the administration has appointed Amos Huckstein as an energy uh, envoy. 
And he was in Ukraine at the S conference this past uh, weekend, and we had a chance to speak there. And I think Orsaya and Anders, I see on here, had a chance to speak with him. And he is now engaged in talking about what we can do to help Ukraine you know, in its energy security. Uh, I would posit very simply, the goal has got to be helping Ukraine become energy independent. That is to say a net energy exporter within the next five years. Uh, we should be uh, working actively with Ukraine and Germany and the EU to put in place whatever's necessary for that to come about. It's gonna require more foreign investment that may require some loan guarantees, may require some encouragement to the private sector, uh, but we need to do more. And it's going to require a tolerance for fossil fuels because in the short term, the way Ukraine achieves this energy independence is through gas and oil development. And then the longer term is helping Ukraine uh, stabilize its electricity grid, decouple it from Russia and couple it to Europe. And that may take a couple of years, uh, but doing that is also essential. Of course, the electricity grid is essential for the application of renewables. If it's solar or wind or nuclear or whatever, um, they produce electricity. And so you want that electricity grid to be strong and you want it to be connected to Europe, not Russia. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do there, but that's something concrete that the U.S. can do. Um, a couple other concrete things that were mentioned. Uh, we do need a new uh, U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Two years is far too long to go without a U.S. ambassador there. And uh, I think it's really inexplicable how we, we don't even have a nominee yet. Uh, it's got to happen. Uh, likewise, there needs to be somebody tasked with the responsibilities of engaging in um, the negotiations about Ukraine security, call it Minsk or Normandy or direct with Russia. I don't see the US joining those formats in a formal way because uh, others will not want that. But the US nonetheless can play a critical role in uh, supporting Ukraine, rallying the West, coordinating policies with France and Germany, NATO, and the EU, Canada, UK, presenting that united front, upping the pressure on Russia, and then negotiating with Russia on a bilateral basis as well. So there's a lot the US can do, uh, which again has not been happening for the last year and uh, needs to be resumed. Doesn't matter if it's a special envoy who has it as a unique job, I think there is an advantage to that, and I think it's what President Zelensky wants, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be just as it was when Toria Newland did this in the Obama administration, uh, a sitting official given those responsibilities, provided that that is a real priority for that individual. Um, and then the final thing, I think Aliona made a very good point, and I want to echo it again. Um, Ukraine is not getting a serious answer at the moment about NATO. It's getting a process answer says, yes, you can become a member of NATO, we support you, but you have to join the membership action plan and no, can't have the membership action plan now. So just keep trying and it's completely vague and there's no real discussion about what it will take for Ukraine to be on a genuine pathway to membership. Uh, I think that can only happen with US leadership. Uh, I don't see that at the moment. I think the uh, administration so far is not uh, trying to, or not raising the issue of, of uh, Ukraine's NATO membership very proactively, but it could do so. And the way to do this would be to say, um, Ukraine already has, through the annual national plans, the NATO Ukraine Commission, the training, the exercises, the security assistance, et cetera, all of the tools that it would have in the membership action plan anyway. But what we have are insufficient reforms in Ukraine, including in the defense sector, but not only in the defense sector. And we have insufficient political consensus within NATO that we do want to see Ukraine move uh, along in its uh, path toward membership. A lot of countries in NATO won't say it, but they're concerned about provoking Russia. And there's a real risk to this. Russia's already killing Ukrainians. They could escalate that. And it could be uh, escalated even by Russia's developing a northern front or occupying, uh, as you call it, occupying or taking over the security and the border uh, of Belarus uh, with Ukraine, uh, which would add to Ukraine's security woes. Uh, but I think the U.S. needs to start an honest dialogue with Ukraine about what's needed and within the alliance to say this, we, we can't walk away from our Bucharest commitment. We have to be serious about it, so we have to talk about what it's going to take. Those are all steps that I think could be 
following up the Biden Zelensky meeting. I think getting the strategic framework out there and tasking Blinken and Kuleba to lead that is a good start. The words are all the right words, but now it's time to follow up with deeds. Good, thank you very much. Um, th that was another great contribution. And I think what I take from that is, yes, a lot of the right words, now is time for actions, follow up with deeds. And I, I think your point was very powerful that um, Ukraine needs security. It sees membership of NATO as the obvious way for getting that security, but it's not getting an answer on that. It's just getting process. It's being bounced around with different process answers. But I think you put your finger on it. It's a lack of political consensus among the membership of NATO, which is why Ukraine is not getting a straight answer on, on those questions. I don't think we have David Arahamia with us. So I'm going to move this on to the next stage, the question and answer stage of the meeting, still hoping that David Arahamia will, will join us at some point. Um, perhaps I could remind uh, everyone in the audience, there are two ways in which you can put questions to the panel. Um, you can either write your question in the chat, as some of you have started to do, and I'll read those out. Or if you like, you can raise an electronic hand in the participants section, and then I'll see if I can call uh, one or two of you who are raising hands and we'll get you live on, on the discussion. Um, let's let's start off with with the chat. Um, Ewan Grant uh, has asked uh, that Ambassador Taylor pointed out Ukraine is on the front line and is defending NATO. Will it get the support and what kind and from whom in Europe, which Ambassador Taylor stressed that it deserves? Who won't give this support? Um, perhaps I could um, point that question first at Ambassador Bill Taylor and then at Ambassador Kurt, Kurt Volker. Bill, you first. Sure. Um, yeah, Ukraine is on the front line. Um, Ukraine is uh, uh, fighting in, in multiple fronts. It's uh, obviously fighting on the front line in Donbass uh, militarily. It also is a front line on election meddling. I mean, the Russians started meddling in Ukrainian elections before they meddled in the uh, US presidential election in 20, 2016. Um, ha uh, hacking into uh, uh, electrical grids. Uh, you know, the Russians started in, um, in Western Ukraine um, and then they uh, hacked into pipelines in the uh, East Coast of the United States and uh, food distribution systems. So yeah, Ukraine is on the front line. Um, it ought to have the support. Um, uh, it does have, as we've talked about, uh, it's got strong support from the United States. It's got strong support from the U.S. military. The U.S. military has is uh, got active duty soldiers uh, in Yavorif, uh training Ukrainians. Um, but I will tell you just on that point, the Ukrainians are also training Americans. Uh, that, that, that is, the Ukrainians have experience fighting the Russians that the Americans don't have. And Ukrainians have learned a lot about what the Russians do and how they operate and what kind of tactics um, and the characteristics of their equipment. So, so there's a, a, a very mutual beneficial uh, exercise going on in, in uh, Galveston. Um, so that, that support is there. It's not just the Americans uh, there. There are other NATO members uh, that, are, that are providing that kind of support. Clearly the United States is providing the largest, I mentioned 400 million a year, plus an additional 60 that was just announced uh, uh, two weeks ago. Um, so, so that's there. Um, um, and I will leave it to Kurt, who knows the, the, the uh, NATO members uh, better than I do as to who's not providing this, uh, this kind of a question. But uh, um, I think the Americans are, are, are in the lead and demonstrating leadership on, on this aspect. Well, I'll just chime in quickly after Bill. Uh, everything Bill said is exactly right. Uh, I would say, in addition to the United States, some significant supporters and contributors to Ukraine's defense are Poland, the UK, Canada, and Lithuania. Uh, I don't think I left out another major one. Uh, but one thing we need to look at is uh, the degree to which this is a NATO policy. Again, to Aliona's earlier point, 
seeing NATO collectively adopt a posture of greater security support for Ukraine would be positive. And secondly, it's the nature of the assistance. And I think uh, lifting the arms ban on Ukraine so that we could provide anti-tank missiles was a very good step uh, back in 2018. But there are further steps we should be taking now. Um, maritime coastal defense and, and maritime domain awareness, air defense before there is any kind of air campaign against uh, Ukraine, electronic or counter electronic warfare and counter drone. Uh, I think these are all areas where the US uh, and other allies could work together uh, with Ukraine to strengthen their capabilities. And, and I should have one other country who is helping a lot is Turkey. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, both of you, very much. Uh, I see that Arisia Lutsevich has raised a hand. Uh, Arisia, as I'm sure you all know, is the manager of the Ukraine Forum. Arisia, uh, you, you're in Lviv at the moment, I believe. Please, please put your question. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you for this excellent outlook and analysis. I think it really helps to put different puzzles in the right picture. Uh, and uh, as um, you've correctly spoken about Biden's you know, priorities, and people talk about three C's, right? China, COVID, climate. Uh, I would like, and, and I would like to add the fourth C and ask whether it's a priority and to ask about two of those. So another one is corruption, because I remember Biden was quite vocal at the beginning about co anti-corruption efforts being one of um, his priorities and linking it also with the national security and illicit flows that we see from you know, countries like Russia uh, and our region uh, going into um, real estate, but also into subversive activities against United States. And, and, and here I would like to ask whether, because if we are talking about US-Ukraine alliance, whether this alliance could turn against some of those people, like in case of one of the oligarchs in Ukraine, Firtash, Dmitro Firtash. Um, do you think it's too sensitive? I don't know maybe who can take it, maybe Ambassador Taylor. Do you think it's too sensitive issue? It will not be really on the agenda because I think this would be very much in the interest of, you know, Ukrainian reforms, uh, civil society here, real that, that is on this de-oligarchization move that is happening, especially now. There's a feeling that it will be too populist of an effort without real, you know, legs behind it to limit influence of those individuals. So that's one thing. And another one is China. I don't know if Alona, you can talk a little bit. Where do you see risks for Ukraine in this? Uh, you know, competition or even um, possible rivalry between United States and China. Uh, we should remember Ukraine, uh, China is now number one, you know, export for Ukraine markets. There are questions of regulations of uh, uh, 5G and in a way where Ukraine will sit. Um, if you can just tell us whether there's any discourse about it in Kiev and what do you think about it? Thank you so much. Robert, I'm glad to start off, um, and I'm going to defer to Kurt on the oligarchization, who is the American expert. But just, just to be clear, um, that work has to be done by Ukrainians. It has to be done by Ukrainians. And Kurt's had some great ideas about how, what Ukrainians can do on that. And some of those ideas are already being uh, implemented, or at least, you know, there's a big law that uh, uh, David Arkhamia can talk about when he comes on, uh, that, you know, there's some work being done on, uh, on the oligarchization. Um, uh, on your question about uh, the Biden administration adding a, uh, a fourth C um, on corruption, um, I, I will just note, that it, I will acknowledge, Arisia, that uh, uh, President Biden earlier on, several months ago, when asked about NATO membership at some, some other forum, um, he, he, he started talking about uh, reform. Um, um, and he toned it down. He toned it down in this uh, in this uh, summit, in the summit with uh, President Zelensky. Uh, rightly, in my view, um, you know, again, as Kurt has indicated, um, uh, the first priority really is security. Um, reform is important, and you, you got to do both. You got to win both of those fights. You got to win the fight against the Russians, and you got to win the fight against corrupt oligarchs. Um, but in but you but. Security was rightly first on this thing, and uh, President Biden, you know, forewent, if that's the right verb, the uh, the opportunity to talk about, you know, to, to reiterate what he had said earlier about reform in NATO. Um, there are some there are some uh, defense reform issues, uh, steps that still have to be taken, um, and those, by the way, are included. Those defense reform steps are included every year 
um, in the U.S. legislation that provides that $400 million a year, uh, half of that is usually almost always conditioned on new steps on, on defense reform. And, and every year, it's, the, the, the reform steps have been taken, have been met. And so the, that, that fund, those funds have been, been released. Um, on your point about um, there, there, there are things that the United States can do and have done, uh, what we have done on, uh, on oligarchs. And you mentioned Firtash. Um, and Kolomoisky, um, we, have we have put sanctions on people uh, that violate US law. Um, and we've shown that we are willing to do that, sensitive or not. Um, and, and, but, but again, that's what we could do under our law. What the Ukrainians have to do um, is more important, frankly, than what the Americans have to do on, uh, on de-oligarchization. But again, Kurt is the man on, uh, on the oligarchization and has, has spent a lot of time thinking about this. So, so over to you, Kurt. Well, thanks, Bill. As, as, you, as you know, this was one of my you know, pet projects uh, for the two years I was a uh, special representative because it, it struck me that um, uh, corruption, everyone talks about corruption in Ukraine, but corruption is the means uh, the problem is the political economic structure of the country. Uh, you have too few people who own too much, and that creates a desire to control through the corrupt means, judiciary, the RADA, the media, and so forth. Uh, so my, my recommendation to Ukraine has been and remains, uh, the focus here has got to be antitrust legislation. You need to put in place limits as to what any one individual or business is allowed to own uh, so that it creates diversity and competition and competition creates a demand for the rule of law. Uh, so it, it turns things on its head. We did this in the US in the early 1900s. Other countries have experience with this as well. And I think that would be the right way to go because it's a systemic fix. And when you make a systemic fix like that, then you just let it apply as it will to people. Uh, the current approach to de-oligarchization is a little concerning because it seems to be more targeting individuals, saying we want to go after this one or this one, and then magically we're not going after that one. Why is that? Nobody knows. Uh, and so it's, it seems like it is more about the people than it is about fixing the structure. And I think that is, that's something that um, uh, will still be needed if you want, if Ukraine wants to really uh, make a make a, a, a great leap against uh, corruption, rather than just targeting a couple of individuals. Great, thank you to our two ambassadors. Now over over to Aliona. Um, Aliona, Arisia had a question for you as as well. <clears throat> yeah, um, I I actually will try to combine two questions about anti-corruption and corruption and China. Uh, because uh, those, two uh, those two issues is about uh, different reading of um, security threats in the US and uh, in, the in Ukraine. Uh, because uh, President Biden and some people from his team, they, um, they are quite convinced uh, that Corruption is um, number one security threat for Ukraine, not Russia. And uh, in Ukraine, we see it differently. We see it that uh, Russia actually number one security threat. And the same with China. <clears throat> uh, when um, for the US is number one, is perceived as number one security threat, the most like complex threat, for Ukraine, China is not a threat at all, at least at this stage, at this point. And uh, actually, again, is Russia as a number one external security threat. So for us, actually, Russia is uh, both internal and uh, external number one security threat, not corruption and not China. And on uh, Ukraine-China relations, yes, we have quite a lively discussion in Ukraine how to treat China as uh, our number one bilateral trade part partner. And uh, as a result of this discussion, 
uh, we are sending quite mixed messages because China is listed uh, is not listed as our strategic partner as Ukraine's strategic partner in our national security strategy, which was adopted last year, actually a year ago in September. Uh, and uh, uh, but China is listed as our strategic partner in the recently adopted uh, strategy, foreign policy strategy. So we have two strategies and in one strategy China is our strategic partner and in foreign policy strategy uh, or national security strategy is not our strategic partner. So, and that is the result of, of the discussion we have in Ukraine and uh, um, I think that strategic partnership cannot be measured or defined by the level uh, of trade, what is happening now in Ukraine. Moreover, I think that Ukraine should start and should be more care uh, should, about decreasing uh, trade dependence from China. And it is in Ukraine's interest actually uh, uh, this trade flexibility with China because this um, trade dependence could be used at any moment and maybe it's even it was used already as a leverage as Chinese leverage on Ukraine in some uh, not trade related issues um, unfortunately and uh, also you know there is a discussion on in infrastructure projects and um, some enthusiasm about infrastructure projects with china because you know that president zelensky is uh, uh, for him infrastructure is is very important part of his presidential agenda uh, and electoral agenda. Uh, that's why, you know, uh, there is an attempt to find um, as many infrastructure projects uh, and loans as, as possible. And uh, also, you know, that uh, Ukraine should be more cautious about China, Chinese loans for infrastructure uh, based on, um, <clears throat> based on experience of some Asian and even European countries like Montenegro, you know. Thank you, Aliona. Um, I think you've, you've made a very interesting point there about relations with China, which of course are changing and being re-evaluated by many countries. I'm reminded of Australia, uh, for which China has been number one economic partner for years, but the United States is its number one security partner. And this has been an uncomfortable position for Australia as well. I'll, I'll turn to another question. We have one here from Vladislav Faraponov. Big thanks to panelists. Ambassador Taylor, you mentioned the emerging Biden doctrine. How would you describe it towards Europe and the Central Europe region and particularly towards Ukraine? And Vladislav may be assuming that there's more of a Biden doctrine than there really is, but um, Bill, over to you. Uh, thank you, Robert. And you're right. There, as, as as I mentioned, we're 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 we might be seeing the emergence of a Biden doctor. It's not there yet, uh, but the, but the president has made several statements, um, and one of the key components of this emerging doc, uh, doctrine, if if indeed there is such, is the importance of democracies standing up to autocracies. Um, and this gets to your question about uh, Eastern Europe, and in particular about Ukraine. Um, so Ukraine is clearly a democracy. Uh, Ukraine has had, you know, five peaceful, fairly peaceful transfers of power from president to president. They've had free and fair elections. You know, there've been some rocky elections here and there, and we've all participated, you know, observed them, and some Ukrainians have participated in them. But by and large, they've been free and fair, according to both Ukrainians and the international community. So it's Ukraine's clear democracy, um, and it is being challenged by, invaded by, um, uh, has, has part of its territory annexed by an autocracy, uh, by Russia. This fits into exactly the Biden doctrine. I mean, here's Ukraine, 
um, uh, uh, democracy defending itself, and as I say, defending broader uh, Europe, NATO, the West, um, from this autocracy that is, that is clearly aggressive, that is clearly uh, uh, fighting a war against, against democracies. And so I would say that it, the Ukraine fits smack into that emerging doctrine, if indeed that's the case. Great, thank you. Um, another question here from Richard Wright. Um, the German government has promised to react with sanctions if Russia threatens gas supplies through Ukraine. How confident is Ukraine with this commitment? How strongly would the US react if Germany failed to meet it, given that Germany is a key US ally? Okay. Can we put that first to Aliona, uh, get a Ukrainian view, and then I'll ask um, one of our US panelists to give an American view, Aliona. I would say that not confident at all, to be, to be honest. So there are a lot of concerns and you know that to be confident um, based on some talks with Russians, with uh, Russian President Putin is, uh, is to be too naive, let's say. Um, that's why um, Ukrainians um, are doing their best in order to, uh, to stop the project uh, even at this stage even at this stage. Uh, and uh, also when we talk about German government, uh, we talk uh, mostly about some agreements um, and decisions made with Chancellor Merkel, but we know that there would be election in Germany. And we don't know how committed new German leaders would be to uh, to those agreements and decisions made in the past. And that's why we, are, we were a little bit, you know, um, disappointed in Ukraine that uh, that decision was taken in the White House and probably President Biden was um, disinformed about uh, this project and about um, um, like uh, consequences of, of uh, implementation of this project. Thanks, Oliana. So Ukraine not confident about this commitment. Um, Ambassador Taylor, or no, uh, Ambassador Volker, Kurt Volker. Um, uh, I just wanted to address this because it came up at the YES conference over the weekend. Uh, and so there are some points that, that were made there that are worth probably for the audience here to hear. Um, one of the issues that I think we face is that Russia is already restricting gas supplies to Europe, it has been for the past four months, so that they're not providing gas at a level that allows European countries to fill their coffers, their underground storage for the winter, which means that Europe will be on a uh, as needed you know, delivery basis uh, throughout the winter, which gives Russia maximum leverage. It's also resulted in very much higher prices in gas in Europe kind of hit records right now. President Putin today actually came out and made a statement that uh, getting Nord Stream 2 online quickly would help alleviate this gas shortage in Europe, which of course is directly caused by Russia's decisions not to provide the gas. Uh, so uh, they're already using this. And this has not resulted in the US or Germany saying that Russia is using energy as a weapon and therefore not triggering any kind of sanction. Uh, I think that situation of ambiguity, do we really say that, okay, now Russia is using energy as a weapon, will persist? Uh, it's going to be murky as to whether we think they're doing so or not, and will we call it that or not? And second, uh, if you read that U.S.-German joint statement carefully, what it commits the German government to do is if they determine that Russia is using energy as a weapon, that they will restrict Russian exports of gas to Europe. That seems highly improbable <laughs> because it will be Russia's decision to restrict energy exports to Europe that will be the cause of the crisis. And that will be what will trigger this idea that they're using energy as a weapon. So that one doesn't sound quite right either. So I think there is, I think uh, Aliona's reflection of skepticism very much felt uh, in the audience uh, in, um, 
in the YES conference as well about these issues. And to come back to a point that we discussed earlier, the best answer to this is to get ahead of the curve. Don't wait for Russia to do something. Start building Ukrainian energy independence now. Start talking about NATO and other security measures now. Why wait for Russia to do something? So Robert, just two, two really quick points. Um, number one, um, if, you ask, if you ask people in the United States Senate and some in other parts of the Congress, if, uh, if Nord Stream 2 is a done deal, they'll say no. They'll say it's not yet a done deal. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, um, but, uh, but as, as we know, the Nord Stream 2 has still some regulatory hurdles to, to go through and there are some sanctions pending um, in, this, in the United States that uh, will, will complicate that. So it, it's, I, I'm not quite over. Um, no, and number two, the only thing other, I'd say is Kurt's exactly right to refer to that document. And the Ukrainians are exactly right to look at that document and say, this is what the Germans committed to. Hold the Germans to those commitments. Hold the Germans, um, whichever government emerges from the elections, hold them to those commitments. And there are people in the United States um, that uh, have dealt with the Germans on these issues who say um, that the Germans w have a good record of abiding by those agreements. So hold them to it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got a, a very interesting comment in the chat from Alistair McBain. Um, who has spent a number of years working in oil and gas in, in Ukraine. And I'm just wondering whether Alistair is available to come and put his points live. Alistair, are, are you? Yeah, I, I, my point is really uh, follows on on the point of energy independence for Ukraine, fossil fuel energy independence, which I think Ambassador Volker um, specifically referred to. And having worked in the sector for, for 10 years, actually, I've heard and supported many times the idea of Ukrainian energy independence based on fossil fuels. However, the reality is that over that period of time, what has happened is that uh, foreign investment has dried up and uh, the fossil fuel industry is even more dominated by the state and, and by the oligarchy uh, and production has gone down and considering the fact that even if there was an immediate u-turn in ukrainian policy such that energy inv investments were, were welcomed uh, and i must say that i my personal view is that PSAs, which there's been a lot of talk about, are not a silver bullet. But e even if there was an immediate change in, in climate, the, the investment cycle from getting somebody in to risk exploration to creating production is going to be at least five years, even if there weren't bureaucratic hurdles to delay that process still further. And I'm just wondering, if you take a five-year view, is that not too long given the energy transition and isn't isn't it better now to focus perhaps on some other things I, I know this is a bit of a gloomy view and i wish it wasn't true but that's uh, that's my question for the panel thank you very much alistair i i wonder if um ambassador kurt volker you want to come back on that view from well, a, I'll, an oil I'll and gas you, practitioner yeah i'll give a couple quick points uh first off uh you're absolutely right that this has been talked about a lot and nothing has happened uh, so that, that's a fact. Uh, Zelensky has been in office only for two years. I think prior to this, we can write off that time period and say, okay, for whatever reason, the, it was not seriously pursued by the Ukrainian government at that time. But now there is an opportunity for Zelensky to do this. Uh, second, I think NAFTA gas um, was... A, a basically, it was originally created as a means of lining the pockets of politicians. And it was substantially cleaned up with the, the CEO at the time, Kobolev, with an oversight board, uh, really modernized into a very professional company. So that helped clean up the corruption side of it. However, by being that new modern company, Naftagaz developed a self-interest in remaining a government monopoly which has then prevented foreign investment and prevented diversification of ownership and new exploration and new production. I think the recent changes in the leadership of NAFTA gas 
um, allow for a new approach where NAFTA gas may welcome outside investment, the Ukrainian government may welcome outside investment. Uh, so I think it is, it is highly relevant to, to push on this again, even though you're completely right about the past. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Um, now I'm going to read out a question from James Nixie, who's head of the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House. James says, the speakers have all been reassuring for those who might have been fearing that Ukraine was being abandoned by a retreating Biden administration. That said, we can't ignore the fact that the US went the other way on Nord Stream 2, which even if more of a sop to Germany than for Russia, was surely a blow to Kiev. And it didn't have to happen. Is this just political reality and inevitable compromise? But why? Or would the speakers at least put it in the negative ledger in terms of US support for Ukraine? Um, perhaps again, I, I could ask Aliona to start. Aliona, give us, give us the view from, from Kiev. Uh, of course, it's a uh, yeah, negative ledger, and uh, I think that uh, a huge disappointment by Biden administration in Kiev because of that decision. <clears throat> uh, given that President Biden himself, he, uh, he made it clear that uh, Nord Stream 2 is a bad deal for Europe. Also, you know, uh, sometimes uh, <clears throat> Uh, it looks like a little bit schizophrenic approach because in a joint statement uh, signed by the, when Zelensky was in Washington, Nord Stream 2 was mentioned as a threat to Europe, to, uh, to European security. And in the same time, you know, Biden administration made that decision. It means that uh, they are fine with undermining European security, or you know, so it's it's little bit yeah ambiguous as Ambassador um, Volker mentioned, and from my point of view, it's it's even schizophrenic maybe, <laughs> and um, also uh, as many of our panelists and uh, participants know. Ukraine um, wanted to discuss a sort of security package as a, I, 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 I don't like the word uh, compensation, but a security package as a way to, um, <clears throat> uh, to, to, to do this process, maybe not as disappointing for Ukraine and to, uh, because we consider Nord Stream project as first, first of all, as a security project, as security threat. And uh, we actually haven't succeed in, um, uh, in securing that security package, let's say in this way. Um, security defense uh, or strategic defense framework is not enough, unfortunately. Um, NATO membership and even MAP is still uh, very distant and Germans didn't want even to discuss that as a part of that security package. And we didn't uh, receive anything actually. We, uh, we haven't received anything in exchange of that decision or as a, uh, as a sort of compensation or that's why, that's why, yes, uh, I think uh, this issue will be discussed and uh, we know that uh, some American officials, they didn't want to discuss that. Uh, they didn't, uh, they were not even ready to discuss during the visit, but President Zelensky had to do that because there is a huge demand in Ukraine uh, for discussing and for making it clear, you know, um, because, you know, we would like uh, this rhetorical and global US administration policy, which is very good and very reassuring to be followed by concrete actions and practical steps. And uh, we still lack those practical steps and concrete actions. 
as it was mentioned in the beginning, but it's important to, to reiterate because probably the main challenge for next couple of months and next year. Thanks, Alula. Ambassador Taylor, do you want to comment on that? Uh, only briefly, we've talked a whole lot about Nord Stream 2. Um, you know, it, it, most people on this call, you know, probably share uh, the owner's view. I certainly do. I think Nord Stream 2 was a bad decision on the, on the part of the administration. It was hotly debated, as people know, within the administration, and they were people, um, you know, the, uh, and my sense is that uh, the people were in the administration who were concerned about the U.S.-German relationship um, had the upper hand in that conversation, and they ignored or ignored too strong. They, they uh, didn't uh, put sufficient weight on the effect on both Russia and Ukraine. I mean, this clearly helps Russia for all the reasons that we talked about in terms of security and uh, energy security of, of Europe, um, and, and it hurts Ukraine. Um, and and uh, uh, that said, it's not the only issue in the U.S.-Ukraine relationship. I mean, as as uh, Anona, you pointed out, I mean, you take a look at the at the uh, joint statement. It's pretty long. I mean, it's five pages of a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of it are commit. A lot of these things are commitments to to flesh out, as uh, Curtis pointed out, as you pointed out, as you pointed out as well. And if I said that is, you know, if if uh, Ukraine is in, uh, in the forefront of the fight of democracies against autocracies, then that 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 suggests support. That suggests a lot of support for Ukraine, and that needs to be demonstrated. And whether it's in terms of uh, uh, helping with the negotiation on getting the Russians out of Donbas. Um, and eventually out of Crimea, or whether it's uh, on on the on holding the Germans to their commitments um, on uh, on Nord Stream, you know that's what allies do. That's what partners do, um, and and they don't agree on everything. You know, there's, there's, I can't think of any country, um, even Canada, you know, where the U.S. Canadian relationship is is you know there are problems there. We're strong allies. There's no doubt about. It. Look at the U.S. U.K. relationship. You know, we disagree with them on some things. That's that's what happens. Um, and, and you continue the discussion, you continue the discussion in the overall framework of the United States being the strongest supporter for Ukraine um, in the world, I will say that, um, I think that's a fair statement. Um, and, and I think my sense is that Ukrainians, this government and Ukrainians more broadly appreciate that we are the strongest supporter um, in the world of, of Ukraine. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, I'm gonna move on, try and fit in one or two more questions before we finish. There's a, a broad one here from Josko Joseph Puharic. The question, where is Ukraine in Mr. Biden's agenda is I think part of the broader question, where is Europe, NATO, and consequently Ukraine in Biden's and US foreign policy agenda. After somewhat erratic years under the past administration, there was great hope in Europe with the coming of the new administration, which was largely shattered under impressions of internal situation in the US and botched blitz pullout from Afghanistan. The question to the panelists would be, do they think there is enough awareness of the gravity of the situation and possible tectonic geopolitical challenges with the perceived diminishing US influence? and US will to reinforce its role on the world stage. This looks more potentially dangerous and destabilizing than climate and COVID crisis. So I think what Mr. Pukharic is asking is, should we be coming back to US intentions, US determination? Uh, Ambassador Volker, do you want to start with that? Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, Yoshko, I agree with you. Uh, I think that this is the, the big issue and the serious issue. Um, and we do need to be talking about this. Unfortunately, I've seen um, several spokes, senior level officials, spokespeople for the administration disagree with this analysis. Uh, there, I would say in a little bit of denial that what's happened on Nord Stream, but more importantly, what's happened with Afghanistan uh, has caused a renewed perception of a US in retreat and a lack of will and resolve from the United States. They don't see that. They think that they have done the right things and they think that we have the freedom to choose what to do in the future. Uh, we're actually 
reducing our footprint in Afghanistan to focus on China, but I think they are vastly underestimating the political and psychological dynamics around perceptions of U.S. will and resolve. Uh, and, that, and that also gets to the point I made earlier about words and deeds. A lot of the words have been right, but if people don't see the actions to follow, they are uh, disinclined to believe. And just one final point, I, I don't wanna single out the Biden administration here. We've had three presidents in a row who have uh, viewed pulling the U.S. back from commitments abroad as a, a principal objective. We've had Obama seeking to end two wars, uh, not fight other people's civil wars, um, pivot to a, a new agenda rather than an old security agenda. We had Trump who wanted to do America first, wanted to pull out of Afghanistan, but didn't, uh, wanted to pull out of uh, Iraq and Syria. And now we have Biden who wants to do the same things as well. So this is a bigger long-term trend that people see. And I do think it is something that uh, is worth talking about and all of us trying to figure out how we address. Thank you. I'm just, yeah, thank you. Just on, on this point, I know you're running out of time. Um, yeah, it's clearly something to talk about. There's no doubt it's something to talk about and something to be concerned about. And my sense is um, that the Biden administration is talking about this. I mean, President Biden, uh, as Kurt just said, uh, uh, rationalized um, the withdrawal from Afghanistan um, uh, so that um, he can focus on China and Russia. Let's be clear. I mean, he said uh, both of those, and he put them in the context of autocracies, which I've come talked about a couple of times today. Um, so he's concerned about China. Yeah, longer term threat, uh, uh, challenge, I think they call it. Um, uh, but Russia is the near term threat. Um, uh, Russia is, the, Russia is the, in, in my view. And I think there is a recognition that exactly what, what, what questioner asked and what Kurt just said, that is there's this recognition that, yes, um, we do need to reassure our allies. That's part of the Biden doctrine is reassure allies, focus on China and Russia, uh, don't fight internal civil wars in other parts of the country, don't try to build nations. And, and here again, I'll just come back to the point that Ukraine fits all of those categories. Um, so I think that this, is really, this will be a good indication of, of where the Biden administration will go. Thanks, Bill. Um, Aliona, um, would you like just to give us a few concluding words of how you see this, and then we'll have to wrap up this, this meeting. I think that if we want US, uh, Ukraine relations work this time, if we want to use this new chance and if we want, if we really want to stop Putin and to transform Ukraine into functional European state, it's not enough just to update Obama administration approaches. It's time to upgrade those approaches and upgrade significantly. So unless uh, current administration is not ready to develop a new bold strategy on Ukraine and on on our region, I think uh, we will have the same results as we as we had in the past under Obama administration and the, some other American administration. So it's uh, you know if there is no willingness to raise stakes on Ukraine, as for example Putin is doing, um, we we would we would not succeed. Uh, despite joint statement, despite uh, other agreements and strategic partnership commission. So we need this new bold strategy. We need a real upgrade, not an update of uh, approaches, uh, uh, of former approaches. So that, that's my conclusion. Thank you very much. Well, a big thank you to all three of our panelists and to all of you who've joined us for this meeting. I think um, we've had some very good discussion of the relationship between Ukraine and the United States and the fairly obvious conclusion that things look different depending whether you're looking at them from Ukraine or from the United States, the number of issues that you have to deal with. Uh, but I think common ground that for all the uh, the nice words, the right words that were spoken at the, the meeting of the two presidents, there's a lot of work to be done to, to make concrete progress and to take this forward. So a big thank you to all of you. I'm sorry for those of you who asked questions that we didn't have time to, to get to your questions, but do please 
keep coming to our meetings. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.